Hello, Ma'am Sonia. Welcome to the part four of the four part series, The Black Family. We've made it. I want to introduce my mom, Erica Thomas. She is the child of you and Rose Love. First of all, allow me to say thank you for agreeing to share your story to speak with the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church virtually. As you know, our theme for this year is the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity. As we begin this interview, Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, Hello, Mount Sinai. My name is Erica Danielle Love Thomas. Um, I was born on March 9th, 1980 here in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I have been at Mount Sinai all my life. Um, I was baptized by my father, Reverend Hugh Love, in um, 1987 at the age of seven years old. Um, of course, um, Cameron's already mentioned that my mom and dad are um, uh, Rose Love and um, Reverend Hugh Love, both of uh, which have uh, passed away. Uh, my grandmother is Miss Paritha Elms, who has passed away. Um, Miss Bernice Simmons is my great grandmother and Miss Jessie Hodges was my aunt, Miss Simmons's sister. Um, they were all members of Mount Sinai until they passed. I have um, two sisters and three brothers. I have Marion Love, Sonia Love, both of which are here. I have Pastor Kevin Love, who's in San Antonio, Texas. I have Minister Anthony Love, who's in Junction City, Kansas, um, both of which are married. Um, and have grown children. Um, and I have my little brother, um, Dr. Q.T. Love Jr., who's a psychologist there and works for um, the city of New York, or actually a hospital now, um, where he um, talks to, to youth. Okay, now that we know a little about you, let's get started. Mm -hmm. How do you identify yourself? Well, I identify myself um, as an African-American woman. Um, I remember being in school and doing the bubble in for the test and it was black. There was no African-American. So you can't say black or African-American, but primarily at this point it's African-American. Okay. How has this identification changed over time? Um, like I said, we, the identification, I think, for what we can now call African-American people has changed over time because years ago, when my parents were younger, we would have never thought of calling people African-American. You were Negro or Black. But my identification personally has been Black or African-American. Um, I've never had to be to bubble in Negro or anything like that. Um, people were also referred to as, as colored. I remember when I worked at the law firm, I had a, an older African-American woman um, call to the law firm to speak to me and she asked to speak to um, the colored girl that worked for the attorney. And the receptionist was so offended that she had called me that, but then I had to tell her this woman is from very, very deep in Mississippi. They were still calling each other colored. But like I said, I identify primarily as African-American. Okay. Is your cultural identity important to you? Why or why not? Yes, yes. Uh, my cultural identity um, to me is very important. Um, I think your cultural identity has a lot to do with who you are as a person. I find it very important to identify with who you are as a person and your cultural identity is going to have a lot to do with that. Um, everybody has a culture, whether they like it or not. And I think it's important for people to try to find out as much about their culture as you can. It doesn't necessarily define who you are in total and in whole 
but it's a very important part of who you are as a person and how you'll ultimately live your life. It's going to have something to do with it. So you need to embrace the cultural identity. Awesome. When you were a child, who was the oldest person you knew? And what story did you remember them sharing with you in relation to Black history? For example, slavery, death, lynching, etc. What story helped you to see that the world was not as you thought it should be? Well, there were a few older people I knew. Um, I was I was raised here in Memphis, and um, my grandmother, um, grandmother's great grandmother and grandmother owned a store um, on Orleans by the name of Benny Sundry. So there were quite a few older people in that neighborhood. Of course, my great grandmother was the oldest in our family, but there were several older people that lived in that neighborhood. Um, and I think most of what I remember is about them just living there, um, growing up in the country, having to go to certain places. They couldn't go everywhere everyone else went. Um, my grandmother's um, father, great grandmother's father was a minister, a traveling minister, and they couldn't stay where certain other people stayed. They had to be careful about where they stayed. That reminds me of like the green book. Like there were certain places where people could stay. Um, also, um, there was, you know, um, T.T. Jackie, her father, uh, Reverend E.W. Higginbottom, um, his father was lynched when he was just a little boy. Um, and he's, he's, he's gone. He had told the story, of course, before he passed away last year about what happened with his father. He was so very young when it happened, but to just think that somebody you're talking to had a family member that was actually lynched. That wasn't so long ago. Um, I remember, you know, my dad and my mom were here when Martin Luther King got killed here in Memphis, Tennessee, and how angry they were. And even my father going downtown, I don't know what he was going to do when he got down there, but he did come back home that night. So he, he was okay. Um, and of course, one of the biggest stories that we are all familiar with at this point in time is Granny Rose, my mom Rose. Uh, being one of the first um, eight um, African-American or Black students to, to integrate the University of Memphis. Um, I did not get told this story a lot when I was younger. I think she was more, more focused on being my mother. But as we got older, as I got to college, I got to know this story and I thought it was great. She was so very modest about it. Um, you know, she didn't graduate. She decided to have a family and raise her children. But she was such an intelligent woman. Uh, she was one of the top in her class at Hamilton High School, which is why they chose her, most likely to succeed the salutatorian of the class. So they picked the top African-American people or students in the city because they wanted the best to try to integrate the school. So she was one of the best. And she didn't want to go there. She wanted to go where her friends went. She wanted to go to Lemoyne or University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, where she could go with her friends. But instead, she chose that route. So that was hard because they were rejected. Um, some people did not like them. There were a few people. She talks about how her accounting teacher says she got the highest score on the accounting test and had her stand. And some students clapped. And you know, some of them just kind of looked crazy. Um, they had to be off campus at a certain time. They, they couldn't interact. They couldn't socialize. Just imagine not being able to socialize with, with anybody or nobody. Everybody's looking at you funny. So um, she didn't finish there. Um, her mother passed away um, a little while after she went there and she decided to not go back. But um, she did make it. She was so intelligent. She just, she was so modest. She never really 
really talked about that to all of, you know, to the children. I mean, we just thought, you know, she's our mom, of course. Everybody knows that mom is smart, but that's kind of how we we felt. <laughs> Was there anything you felt you couldn't do because of your race? Mm. That's a kind of a, I thought about this question. I don't think there's anything. I thought about this and I wanted to say no, but I think a lot of times you have to realize that when people look at me or they look at you, they see brown skin. And that's a, really important to some people, to some people, not so much. Um, so when I interviewed for, for positions, when I got out of, out of college, I had a paralegal degree. I got passed up for quite a few jobs, um, even taking a job that was lower than a paralegal, eventually working myself up to it. But I remember one specific instance where I did an interview and they told me I didn't have experience. I was new. I never had a paralegal job, but come to find out one of the girls I graduated with that was Caucasian or white got that position. But you told me that I didn't have enough experience. So that made me feel a little slighted and a little, you know, uh, it, it, it hurt. It made me think about, okay, well, was it because of my race? I mean, she had the same amount of training I had, or maybe it was because she, who she knew. So sometimes, yes, um, whether you want it, I, I'm still going to try. I'm not going to stop because I'm a black woman, an African-American woman. But sometimes I have to realize, okay, these people may be looking at you for, you know, with the color of your skin. But now, you know, working in healthcare, you know, that's that's changed. I'm one of the only African-American um, oncology nurses, uh, physician nurses, um, at Baptist Cancer Center, there's there's another now, but that that feels good to know that hey, maybe now I'm in a profession so much, but people still do look at your skin color, but when you're sick, not so much. Please share a moment when you experienced racism, and what was your reaction? Racism. Um, first, I spoke of the the job interview. Um, aspect um you know in this day and time there is some blatant racism and i've had family members that have truly experienced um being called out of their name or being threatened i think the only the one of the most memorable times i can remember um as far as racism goes is when me and my husband your dad we were we were driving at that time um, here in Memphis in Germantown. It was at the time where I had a smaller car, my, my black Honda Civic, which had darker tinted windows because that's, that's what my husband wanted to do to the windows. Not so dark, but a little dark. We passed by a, um, a Germantown deputy. He was, we looked at him. We saw him sitting there. So we were going to a uniform shop because, um, I'm a, I was looking for nursing uniforms. We pulled up in front of this shop and the police officer pulled up in, um, he pulled up in the parking lot. Yeah. And you know, in the back of his head, my husband's head, he was like, this man is, is following us. Um, so I went in the store, I came out and we proceeded on to go to another store. We pulled up into um, the parking space and the vehicle, the, sh the, the police officer's vehicle pulled up right behind us. So yeah. we got out of the car and he did too. And he told us, you know, don't move. And we're just standing there like, you know, we're parked. We're fixing to go in a, a store. Why are you telling us not to move? And, you know, my husband is visibly getting upset. Um, and the guys, he, he seemed to be pretty shaky. And at this time, this was shortly after, I think Michael Bland um, was killed. And all I could think about was trying to keep my husband calm because 
I didn't know what this man was going to do. That's all I could think about as his wife. And the man, he really didn't have any questions. He commented on the tent. My husband asked him, well, is there anything you can do to prove that this tent is too dark? He could not. We stood there for several minutes. He radioed people, told us to get back in our car. We sat there um, and there was nothing he could prove. He pretty much, I think, just wanted to see who we are, who are these people that were driving in Germantown in this car that wasn't, I guess, maybe um, that fit the bill for somebody that was gonna be driving in Germantown when in fact, we live not too far away. Um, so. I felt like there was some slight racism there. Of course, you can't really prove it, but I mean, we're standing here, two African-American people in a parking lot, parking our car, talking to this Caucasian police officer about really about nothing and just stood us there kind of embarrassing us for a while. So um, that's what I can remember about racism um, as far as I go. Now my family, um, had several moments, I think, living in Arkansas where there were acts of, you know, racism. Um, I can't think of any extremely notable ones. I know my grandmother worked for several um, white families and they were made to think that they were, you know, less than. Um, so she carried that, I think, in her spirit for a very long time. How did those events affect your life, your family life, and does it still affect you today? Of course, it affects your family life. Um, slavery, racism, the civil rights movement was not so long ago. Um, us as Black people, African American people, we are very new or just coming out of some of this. Um, and we all know that racism and hatred is still very alive and, and well um, for African-American people. Um, I think that we have to spend a lot of time teaching our kids, our children about this. Um, my family pretty much raised us to be people, not just black people, but people, human, kind human beings. Uh, we weren't, we didn't focus on um, a lot of African-American things. We didn't focus on Caucasian things. It was, okay, well, let's try to expose you to this, see if it interests you. Um, I think that with my experience with the police and of course what's been going on in the world with police or just with black men in general, I have to speak to my sons about how to conduct themselves or how to be careful. You always want to tell your kids, police are here to protect you. And then you think about what's gone on in the past couple of years and you're like, well, are they really here to protect us? Some, yes, yeah, some, no, or just men that don't. There shouldn't be police officers. Um, but I tell them to watch their surroundings. They haven't started driving yet, but watch their surroundings, watch who they're with. Watch how people approach them. Do you want to put a camera on the dashboard of your car, your child's car, because you really want to know what's going on? It's you, my daughter, a young African-American woman. I want you to know that you can strive to be anything. Yes, you're brown and people are going to see that. Um, but you can do what you want to do. If it doesn't fit the bill for, say, a black woman will do, it, it doesn't matter. I mean... I think what my family has done, they've experienced some pretty terrible things, but they did not let it affect their success or what they wanted to do. Their success was what was in their eyes as successful, not in what was in somebody else's eyes as being successful. So I think I probably got off of that question a little bit, but I'm sorry, go, go ahead. <laughs> Attitudes have changed since segregation? Of course, attitudes have changed since segregation. Um, I remember my mom and dad telling me about how water fountains were. This was um, black or colored people water fountain. This was a white person colored 
I mean, white person in water fountain and, you know, you could be on this side and they're on that side. And I couldn't imagine a world, I guess, blatantly like that. Of course, it is segregation is still alive. It's just not labeled as such. I think that some of the older generation, you know, view segregation as, okay, it's not labeled that way. Of course, they were still apprehensive. Their, their attitude was still of apprehensiveness because you don't go one day from, okay, here's the color water found, here's the white water found, now we got one and everything's all, okay, it's fine. But now I think because my generation, your generation, a generation before me maybe did not did not actually get to see it that our attitudes are, oh, this is this is given to us. This no, this is, you know, we have a very nonchalant attitude sort towards segregation. Um, when indeed parts of this city are still very much so segregated, um, because some people work to make it that way. Um so I think uh, there are a lot of nonchalant attitudes now as opposed to when the civil rights movement was going on, when people were actually fighting, giving their lives for rights that should have been given to people anyway, because you're a human being. What are your thoughts on mental slavery? Do you think that people are still mentally enslaved today and in what manner? Yeah, um, mental slavery, I, I could probably talk about that for a little while, but in respect to this, yes. Um, I think I've had this conversation with a couple of people before. I had the opportunity to, to work at the University of Memphis in a department called anthropology, which is the study of people, where they come from, everything. So we talked about... Um, Native Americans, um, we talked about Caucasians, and we talked about African Americans and where they come from, the parts of the city they live in. We had urban anthropology. Why this group of people live over here? Why that group of people live over there? Um, I think that where you come from, a lot of times it's going to enslave your mind. Your, your, your family's going to talk to you about what they they know, what they've learned. And unfortunately, in some families, that they don't allow you to expand your mind and there, there becomes some type of mental slavery. Um, some people can't break free of the generational things their families have taught them. We all know that there's some good things in our generation and there's some bad things. A lot of the bad things people are still holding on to thinking that you're less than because you're African-American, you can only do this because you're African-American. Some of that slavery still lives within some people's hearts, their minds, and they're teaching it to their children. So I think there are some forms of mental slavery. We do it to ourselves a lot of times. Um, but like I said, slavery, actual physical slavery is not that far behind us. Um, just a few hundred years. I mean, so we have generation after generation that's still trying to recover from this. And then this study at this department that I worked in is very evident. It was almost shocking to see where people came from years ago and where they are now and how it was so similar, how their mentalities had not changed very much. It was, it, it, it was really shocking. Last question. What would you like to see for growth with the Black family with segregation, with representation, identity, and diversity? So I think, so here's my thing, and I'll talk about my family here. Uh, my family, my father especially, always taught us to, to love to love one another, mankind. I'm pretty sure there's some people he didn't prefer to be around. Uh, my mother as well. But we were always taught, you know, be yourself around everyone. There, and with this respect to diversity, he knew all sorts of people, African, 
um, Native American. He knew um, some Asian people. Um, he knew um, Caucasian people. And we interacted with some of these people when uh, we were younger. I think the, the, the family, the Black family, African-American family needs to concentrate on diversity, getting your children out and letting them know different people, but also being aware of who you are and your culture. Um, it's hard for us sometimes because I think as far as representation goes, you're representing your family. Those, my family, those are some pretty big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. um, they went through a lot of things and there were numerous ones of them. Um, but I think it reverberates back down to me and my siblings. We all did different things in life. Um, my mother and father did not have, um, they did not have a college degree, but they were ve both very intelligent people seeking knowledge. And they put that down in us, whether we wanted to go to the military, whether we wanted to go get a PhD, whether we wanted to go get a couple of bachelor's degrees, associate's degrees, or go back to school because we couldn't really figure it out. Um, it, knowledge, seeking knowledge was also always um, important with us. That, that reigns true um, as far as our identity goes um, in the Love family and the, the Simmons family, um, Elms, all of that, Hodges. We were all a family with different names, but we were all together. That's our identity, that of, of love and of not perfection, not perfection in the least. We were taught that you're not perfect, but um, you're not perfect, but you got to show the world what you can do. Um, and sometimes we're a little shy about it and we come out differently, but I think the black family needs to to instill all of this into into their children. We need to talk about culture. We need to talk about our family. Um, I appreciate Martrice for talking to me about this because I had to go back through some of my old papers and I longed for to talk to my mom and my dad and my grandma because they're not here anymore. And all I think about is, Erica, why didn't you ask her that why she was here? And I even, you know, have some dumbfounded moments where I'm like, well, who can I ask? And I'm like, oh, you know, those significant folks in my family. Now, we might have one left that I needed to talk to are gone. So family members need to get together. They need to talk about the past, whether it was good or bad. Um, I think that's what, um, that's what we need to see for growth with the black family. We need to realize that we can be a family. Um, I know I'm getting a little long winded, but sir, but a lot of times black people, we weren't looked at as families. We have to remember we were in slavery. People were separated. They didn't necessarily have mom, dad, kids. Let's live like their, their slave masters or, or whoever it was. So um, I think as far as growth, we still have a lot of growth to go as, as the black family, but I think it can be done. I think it's just gonna take some effort. Once again, thank you very much for sharing with us a little bit about you and your thoughts on the black family, representation, identity, and diversity. Thank you. Hopefully this has been helpful to someone.